Hello there and welcome to the most watched business show in the country. This is the Business Weekly Show on City TV and I am your host, Michael Lobodu. Please hit me up on Twitter at mobudu and thank you for tuning in as I bring you all the latest business stories that made headlines this week. If you're ready, let's go. Da, 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 da. We start off this week with the usual fuel price hikes and how they affect every other thing. Transport fares are expected to go up soon. To be fair, we can really not blame these transport operators. The last time transport fares were increased was in June when fuel was just about 5 cities, 20 pesos. Now it's just 20 pesos shy of hitting 7 cities per liter. Even though we empathize with them, we are the ones going to bear the brunt at the end of the day. So well. Do you know how much it is likely to go up by? Earlier, the Transport Operators Unions had warned of increasing transport fares effective Monday, October 25, 2021. The unions had earlier collectively sent a petition to the government to reduce the levies and taxes on fuel. However, three weeks of no response, the union says it is under pressure to take matters into their own hands. They have therefore agreed as a union to meet on Tuesday, October 26, to discuss the way forward. In an interview with City Business News, the National PR for the Concerned Drivers Association of Ghana, David Aguadu, said a 20% increase in the fair prices will go a long way to help the drivers' businesses. Our drivers have been complaining very bitterly that we, the national executives, are in bed with the government. Meanwhile, it is not so. We are fighting for the welfare of our members. And that is why that is what is warranting the meeting tomorrow. Because the pressure on us these days is very, very, very heavy. Yes, salaries, wages have not been increased. And the same people that we are we are commuting from one end to the other is those that we are going to do, we are going to think of about the fare. But we are hoping that at least 20 percent, 20 percent will be enough to you know sustain us in the business. Because the other time that we increased, that was in the main, we're supposed to take 20 percent. But the government plead with us that yes, things are hard. We are not in the normal times. But this time around, we are not in the normal town times. But the fuel has shoot up from 27 cities to 31 cities. Even though the unions are hoping government engages them, prior to the meeting, Mr. Aguadu said the transport fares will be reviewed upwards if by close of week nothing is heard from the government. Beside the meeting tomorrow, if any action having been taken before the end of this week, we will be forced to charge 20% 20% on our old fares because cost of maintenance, cost of pass, and cost, cost, let me put it this way, simple, cost of running transport these days is very, 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 very huge and we must recruit it. So my sister, if you ask me, this is what is going to transpire tomorrow or this is what is going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow we are having a meeting. It's between we the transport operators. After we finish this meeting, before we will move on to meet the sector ministers. Hmm. So the 20% that they are proposing will mean that we will now need one Ghana city more for our fares that used to be five cities. Charlie, maybe somewhere. Still in the petroleum sector. I don't know if you've heard about government's plans to ensure local companies run the distribution and sale of petroleum products in the country. Even though this is clearly geared towards boosting the local economy and ensuring we actively participate in the sector, this would mean kicking out already existing foreign companies in the space. And not everybody thinks it's a great idea. The National Petroleum Authority, NPA, 
had earlier indicated a policy to exclusively reserve the importation, distribution and sale of refined petroleum products in Ghana for indigenous companies. Even though no specific time has been stated for its implementation, the NPA says it will be implemented progressively to allow foreign-owned bulk distribution companies and oil marketing companies to recover the full value of their assets. The former chairman of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, Henry Akwabwa, says if this is not reviewed, it may have adverse effects on efforts to attract foreign direct investment into the country. What is the motive behind us as a state, as a nation, wanting some I mean, foreign entities to leave the country? What is, what is, what is the whole objective? For me, that is that is not clear. If the other sign is that you want Ghanaians to fully control the market, then what? Remember, these multinational and I can say them. You have Vivo, Total, Puma, and Engine. Uh, Total, for example, is listed on the Ghana stock exchange, which means that you have Ghanaians owning shares in the business. Vivo Energy, I think, has about 30% or so Ghanaian ownership. Puma Energy has about 50% Ghanaian ownership. Engine has about 55% Ghanaian ownership. So are you saying that these Ghanaians should not get decent returns on their investment? you know, when you are now restricting the market to them. He added that the move might trickle down and negatively impact on other sectors of the economy if it is not properly managed. We have the GIPC going around the, the, the world, I mean, conversing for foreign direct investment. Now, if the foreign investors see this, I mean, then we are just telling them that a couple of years down the line, after their investment, uh, they are going to be asked to leave or the market is going to be restricted to them in a way, you know, that will make their investment uh, not being worthwhile. Uh, so my, my main concern is that, yes, encourage local participation, but do not force the multinational companies to leave. Otherwise, you are closing other investment uh, potentials or um, other foreign direct uh, investors from coming into the country. Still on energy related stories. You know, sometimes it's good to learn from other people's experience so you can make better decisions. Europe is currently experiencing an energy crisis after switching significantly to renewables. Ghana's Deputy Energy Minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, believes that this is a clear indication that Ghana is not in a position to transition from the use of carbon emitting energy sources to the cleaner forms of energy, which the Western world is advocating. With the world drifting to an era of clean energy, developed countries and other international bodies have called on developing economies to start discarding hydrocarbon emitting sources of energy in a bid to control the phenomenon of climate change and global warming. But Ghana's Deputy Minister of Energy, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, says emerging economies need to learn from the energy challenges being faced in Europe. If you look at the energy mix uh, of Ghana and many other countries, it is appropriate that you have different sources of energy because that gives you energy security because any of them can, can fail. And when you don't have diversity, then you have challenges uh, coping with your energy needs. Uh, and this is why over-dependence on one source of energy is not good for, for an economy. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of the energy crisis in Europe, some European countries that are facing crisis today. Because of the transition, the energy transition, they have had to invest so much in wind energy. They don't have much solar, you know, because of their weather uh, uh, conditions, uh, unlike uh, Africa and the tropical uh, parts of the world. They don't have so much sunshine. but. They have wind and they've invested heavily in wind. But wind failed them this time. And because they uh, depend on wind, they were resorting to uh, alternative uh, gas uh, uh, use, the use of gas. But they contracted based on spot uh, contracts, uh, short term contracts rather than long term contracts. And so when the wind failed them, they did not have stock of, of, of natural gas to. Uh, media power needs and this is why they're facing uh, energy crisis. Uh, what this tells us is that 
uh, we cannot go renewable uh, all together at the same time. You know, we have to be very careful. It has to be um, a gradual uh, process. The West can do faster as they are doing, but we in the world, in the developing world in Africa, we have to be very uh, careful. Dr. Bean Adam also said developing countries ought to be allowed to reap the benefits of investments made in hydrocarbons. The producers of hydrocarbons in, in Africa rely on it for revenue, uh, for jobs, and therefore if there is going to be a, a move, a drastic move uh, away from hydrocarbons, what happens to uh, the, the resources that we, we get from, from hydrocarbons? For example, in Ghana, we, we, we spend our oil money on the free education. And so if we don't invest in hydrocarbons, what it means is that we will not have this source of revenue uh, any longer. But at the same time, we are concerned about the environmental effects. And this is why some of us have called for the West to allow us to continue to uh, develop hydrocarbons, but in a more environmentally sustainable manner. For example, by introducing carbon capture uh, techniques. The Deputy Minister may have a point, but the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, also believes that this is a blessing in disguise and it could present an opportunity for us as a country. We have natural gas in excess and we are flaring it on all our oil fields because we do not have the capacity to process all of it. Whilst we are wasting it, Europe is in dire need of it. COPEC is therefore calling for adequate investment in their property infrastructure to help harness a lot of the gas and soon begin exporting it. Headlines like these reflect the current situation with energy on some continents. Europe's gas production has dropped in the past two decades and the continent now depends on imports from Russia. However, the country has limited supplies to Europe this year in what some have called a politically motivated move. Europe is not the only place in need of supplies. Asian demand is jumping as countries including China look to shift away from their dependence on coal. As these challenges persist, Ghana is currently flaring its gas at its fields because of limited capacity. On the other hand, Ghana contributes up to 50% of the liquefied petroleum gas LPG consumed in the country and this is an indication that the remaining 50% is imported. The Chamber of Petroleum Consumers COPEC believes the paradigm must change. Ghana should be looking at uh, investing in what we call the surface infrastructure to tap the gas from the, uh, the various fields uh, upstream. Because without the surface infrastructure, current capacity of Ghana gas cannot uh, refine products uh, that could be uh, transported uh, abroad. Right. So the challenge for us as a country is to invest, invest much in the energy sector, especially invest much in that, that particular infrastructure that will help us tap the gas we are flaring upstream. Until we do that, we cannot export because locally, Ghana gas cannot even feed our local market. Ghana gas is feeding 50%, which tells us that almost 50% is being imported through uh, the West African gas pipeline. And then the other part that Ghana gas even feeds into the country, feeds into the, the power sector uh, through uh, natural gas supply to many of the generators in the, in the country. So what we are thinking as COPEC is that for us to tap into the EU market, Ghana must invest appropriately in the surface infrastructure that will tap the gas and then refine this particular gas for export. That will give us excess revenue or added uh, on revenue uh, from, from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the petroleum uh, revenue we are getting upstream. The head of research and training unit at the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Benjamin Nsia, further highlights the likely economic impact of a fully expanded Ghana National Gas Company. When we improve the surface infrastructure, or the gas surface infrastructure, what it tells us is that gas is going to become cheaper. And then most of the targets we've set uh, for our renewable, uh, in the renewable master plan, we will be able to achieve it. Because Ghana has set a target that by 2030, we should be consuming 50% of LPG in this particular economy. Now, we, are, we, are, we, have, we have attained 25%. But when we expand this infrastructure to, to, to refine more of natural gas into liquid petroleum products, it tells you that the local product will be more cheaper compared to one imported into the country. It will, it will save many households, right? When gas becomes cheaper uh, compared to the alternative, which is charcoal or maybe firewood, then it tells us that the, as a, an economy, we are, we are going much into renewable and safer 
use of uh, a, a fuel which will, will, will reduce certain health uh, challenges uh, we are facing currently. Isn't it worrying that a directive given by the Energy Minister last year for ENI and Springfield to work together after it was revealed that their oil fields were connected still hangs in the balance? ENI Ghana Exploration and Production Limited seems to have some concerns with the directive and has taken a number of legal actions to that effect. But it looks like things aren't going as planned for them because the commercial division of the Accra High Court has thrown out a judicial review application by the company arguing that it, is, it was unmeritorious. Interesting word. Then Energy Minister John Peter Amewu, back in April 2020, gave a directive for ENI and Springfield to execute a unitization and unit operating agreement after an independent study by the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GNPC, showed that ENI's Sankofa oil field and Springfield's Afina oil field were connected. The Sankofa oil field is part of ENI's offshore Cape Three Points project off Ghana's Atlantic coast, which it says has reserves of about 40 billion cubic meters of gas and 500 million barrels of oil. The Afina oil field, on the other hand, which was discovered by Springfield in 2019, is said to contain 1.5 billion barrels of oil and 0.7 trillion cubic feet of gas. While Springfield sided with the minister's call for unitization, ENI and its partner Vitor, on the other hand, have consistently argued that there was no basis for Springfield's Afina discovery to be considered commercially viable and that the ministry's order for unitization was premature. The Ghanaian subsidiary of the Italian multinational oil and gas company about two months ago dragged Ghana to the London Tribunal for attempting to force Springfield EMP on it, a development which President Kufuado bemoaned and promised to resolve. While that case at the London Tribunal is yet to be determined, a similar case brought before the Commercial Division of the Accra High Court by ENI and Vitor has been dismissed for being unmeritorious. ENI was seeking a number of reliefs, including a declaration that the purported directives of the then Energy Minister were illegal. They also sought a declaration that the Minister did not follow due process of law in issuing the purported directives, among others. In describing the judicial review application as unmeritorious, the court noted, among other things, that the motion paper to the application and the affidavit filed by the applicants in support of the application were incompetent. The court also said that a careful read-through of Section 341 of the Petroleum Exploration Act, Act 919, of the year 2018 does not show that the Minister of Energy's directive violated the said provision of the law. The court finally awarded a cost of 10,000 Ghana cities to each of the Attorney General's Department and Springfield ENP. Away from energy-related storage to the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. You know it's been 10 months since the agreement took effect, but we can only boast of two companies that have been able to export their products under the AFTA. That's uninspiring, right? Especially with the many companies we have in the country. But it's not that gloomy because the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry says it is working with other businesses to facilitate their trade under the agreement. The 1st of January 2021 saw the commencement of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Under this Continental Pact, African countries are expected to trade 90% of their goods among each other tariff-free. Experts have explained that tariff removal will reduce cost of trade and increase revenue. A World Bank study further states that if Africans implement this agreement effectively, there is an opportunity by the year 2035 to lift 100 million Africans out of extreme poverty. Thus, the AFTA is expected to significantly increase the intra-African trade and promote structural transformation of the economies of member countries by catalyzing into industrial developments. Despite this fact, only two Ghanaian companies, Casaprecu and Gandor Cosmetics, have so far exported under the agreement. In an interview with City Business News, at the sidelines of the Africa Private Sector Summit, President of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Clement Osea Mwako, said his outfit is in the process of facilitating other businesses to export under the agreement. He further called on businesses in the cocoa value chain to leverage on Ghana's position in the cocoa sector to trade under the AFTA. 
Yes, it's true. Two companies have done under that. That was the initial stage, but a lot of people are coming on board now. We are preparing them to that. But for Ghana, having the headquarters in Ghana shows how serious Ghana is committed to the implementation of AFTA. Um, I happened to travel to Europe recently, and a lot of businesses are coming to Ghana because we have the headquarters here. They think that we are more serious to take up the advantage. Ghana, let's look at Coco, for instance. Uh, when are we going to add value to it? Can we say that when you add agriculture to Ghana, we are producing over 80% of the entire cocoa production in the world? What can these two countries do together? Or even as Ghana, what can we do? Adding value to produce at a lower cost, just as I was telling you, our comparative advantage, so that we can do a lot within the region. And so, like I said, industrialization is key. Ghana should take advantage of that because even with after we are exposed to the world, anybody at all can come and do business in Ghana or come and set this factory either in Ghana or wherever it's, he sits. So, so assuming Nigeria and South Africa as the mines, and then they are producing for the entire continent, and let's say having a major, uh, they, they have the capacity to produce more, and Ghana sits down, then we're going to be as we are. It will affect our, our exchange rate. So I think that we need to look at our industrialization drive and make sure that probably we do a lot with the 1D1F situation and put every structure in place to take advantage of the market. Still on the AFCFTA, very soon you will be able to export food and drugs under the agreement without having to deal with queries from the food and drugs authorities of countries receiving the goods. The various regulatory authorities in member countries under the AFTA are working together to come up with standards that apply across the board. This is very positive news and I'm sure it will encourage more people to take advantage of the agreement. The African Continental Free Trade Area AFTA agreement, which commenced at the beginning of the year, will promote trade amongst member states by removing various trade barriers, including duties. To facilitate this further, with respect to food and drugs, the various regulatory authorities amongst member states are making efforts to standardize such products. This will mean that, once these goods are approved by a local regulator, they will be accepted across the continent. Still on trade, the government has an ambitious target of earning over $25 billion in non-traditional exports. As part of efforts to achieve this, the Minister for Trade and Industry, Alan Chamating, has charged the newly sworn-in board of the Ghana Free Zone Authority to work hard towards the goal. According to the Trade Minister, this target is one of the 10 pillars on which government's new industrial transformation agenda is hinged. For several years now, Ghana has struggled to meet expected targets for non-traditional exports. For a five-year period between 2015 and 2019, Ghana's non-traditional exports grew at a minimal annual average rate of 2.9%. Data from the Ghana Exports Promotions Authority shows that Ghana bagged $2.89 billion from non-traditional exports in 2019. The 2019 non-traditional exports earning was 3.1% higher than that of 2018, which was estimated at $2.83 billion. Latest data from the Bank of Ghana has disclosed that the value of the top 10 non-traditional commodities exported during the second quarter of 2021 amounted to $316.53 million compared to $273.44 million recorded for the same period in 2020. The Ghana Free Zones Authority, the agency responsible for facilitating the setting up of free zones in Ghana for the promotion of export development, has been taxed to work towards achieving the set target for the year. Minister for Trade and Industry, Alan Tremartin, was communicating with the new board of the authority. This new industrial transformation agenda is anchored on 10 pillars. And three of these pillars have a direct correlation and bearing on the work of this important organization. One of the pillars is export development, promoting and enhancing export development. And I'm sure most of you are aware that that's the core mandate of the Ghana Free Zones Authority. 
And now that we have launched a new national export development strategy, which has the target of achieving over 25 billion US dollars in non-traditional value exports. This organization is going to lead the effort in helping Ghana achieve this particular target. Members of the new board of the Ghana Free Zones Authority include the chairman, Alan Chematin, the CEO, Mike Okwe Jr., CEO of Regency Resources Limited, Kinsley Jojo Fosu, educationist and development practitioner, Dr. Susanna Alo, managing director of Canoff Limited, Osei Kufo Can Come, MP for Agona West Constituency, Cynthia Mamle Morrison, head of the SME Department of the Ghana Exim Bank, Rosemary Beryl Acha, CEO of Kwanim GDK Farms Limited, Alex Frimpom Tinkran, and Andrew Esiama Amwako, who is the MP for Fomena Constituency, and the second deputy speaker of parliament to agriculture now and to some very interesting happenings there the government introduced the interest rate subsidy irs under the ghana covid 19 alleviation and revitalization of enterprises support the ghana cares of us program this aims at mitigating the impact of the pandemic on the livelihoods of ghanaians with the irs agribusinesses will pay half the cost of loans they take and the Peasant Farmers Association thinks it's a great idea, but they also made some requests from the government. The government's interest rate subsidy intervention seeks to grant 50% subsidy on financial institutions' interest charges for the loan advanced to qualified agribusinesses. Four value chains have been specifically selected under the program for 2021, which include tomatoes, rice, soya bean, and poultry. However, the capital expenditure component of the program can only be used to replace parts, retooling of existing equipment and and facility to improve operational efficiency. The Peasant Farmers Association, one of the country's largest advocating groups for farmers, however say the intervention could cover a wider range of products. According to Head of Program and Advocacy for the Peasant Farmers Association, Charles Nyaba, even though the intervention is appreciated, this may not be of immense benefit as expected. We have challenges with the soya, but the area that the support is going. I'm just wondering whether uh, that will address the challenges of uh, people who are producing soya. This is a time for harvesting soya. My colleagues have just called me today. Go across soya producing areas. Our major challenge has to do with how to harvest the soya when it's ready for harvesting. Because soya is said that if you don't harvest it on time and then it dries, the pores open and then you can lose everything. And still, farmers are using their hands to approve the soya beans before it is trusted. Everywhere the land is dried, we are finding difficulties in the getting combined harvesters to harvest the soya. But if you look at the credit facility, it's not supporting farmers to actually procure new uh, machineries like combined harvesters. It's only replacement. So the machineries are already not in place. So how is the support going to help them? Because to produce soya, you need to in the first place to till the land, and then you also need fertilizer. You need a combined harvester to get it harvested. He added that a value chain should especially be widened to include maize, which has become a much sought after commodity in recent times. One of the major challenges facing the poultry farmers today has to do with the access to feed. And the major component of the feed is maize, not soya. Uh, poultry farmers use about 70% of their, their, their feed complement from a maize. And we all know the challenges farmers face this year in terms of access to mechanization services, access to inputs like uh, fertilizer and seeds, and then the problem with the uh, water irrigation facility for them to increase their maize production. As we speak, there is shortage of maize everywhere. And uh, along the line, the minister even attempted to give contracts to people to import maize, and they couldn't get some to import. So if you have uh, maize being a major component of poultry feed, and people are crying for support to improve their maize production, 
one would have expected maize to be part of the commodity that are, that are selected. I'm sure by now you've heard of the government's plans to establish the Development Bank Ghana. It hopes to use the bank to provide cheap long-term financing for various sectors of the economy, including agriculture. As unemployment, especially amongst the youth, keep rising, and with talks of going into entrepreneurship as a solution to this challenge, the government is optimistic that the commencement of operations of the Development Bank Ghana will help support the venture capital and private equity industry to grow startup businesses and small businesses. The Venture Capital Trust Fund has for 15 years contributed to the development of Ghana's economy by providing funding for over 60 startup businesses and small and medium-sized enterprises SMEs in the country. The setting up of the Ghana Venture Capital and Private Equity Association is to intensify the efforts of the venture capital and private equity industry by supporting investments into private businesses for job creation and national economic development to catapult the growth of the SME sector. The role of the association is to provide a strong voice for industry practitioners, drive the growth of the industry, and develop the capacity of industry players so they can safeguard investors and investees. But how has the industry been faring all these years? CEO of the Venture Capital Trust Fund, Yao Ousu Brimpon, laments the lack of funding for his outfit, which makes its work difficult. If I'm to talk about our constraints, the number one is funding. And I have to say that it's very unfortunate that the very institution that was set up to provide funding to SMEs, our problem is funding. <laughs> and this is so because when we were established, when Venture Capital Trust Fund was established, we were supposed to get 25% of national reconstruction levy, and that was to become our permanent source of uh, income. Unfortunately, in 2006, the very year that we started operating, that um, levy was abolished and it, was, it has never been replaced. Our second source of funding has been budgetary allocation from Ministry of Finance and that has been, over the years, it has been on and off. And so, we are still in discussion with the Ministry to, one, get us a permanent source of funding so that we can actually deliver on our uh, mandate. So that is our major uh, challenge. Government, on the other hand, plans to help solve this issue. Director of the Financial Sector Division at the Ministry of Finance, Samson Akligo, speaking on behalf of the Finance Minister, Kenoforiata, at the launch of the association, said the Development Bank Ghana will help support the venture capital and private equity industry to grow startup businesses and small businesses. One of the major significant things that we did when some banks were not able to meet the minimum capital is to sponsor a government bank, private equity institution called Ghana Amalgamated Trust to support these financial institutions. The mindset is very clear, is that we want to put in people's mind that private equity and venture capital are very essential when it comes to restructuring and supporting companies in a real way and improve what they stand for. Uh, that we must support. And I think that that legacy needs to be protected. And we can see that it, we have saved a lot of jobs, uh, at least over 5,000 direct jobs, and uh, what I'm told, over 12,000 indirect jobs. So we are going to build on that, trying to make sure that as a country, we have a government-backed private equity fund that supports the ecosystem. We also hope that the development bank will, con will anchor, deliberately anchor some private equity and venture capital firms across the country that will support real growth. Fish is such an important part of our Ghanaian diet. You can almost add it to any of your local dishes from your bankuf to your kenke, you name it. Like these ones here will make some very good palm nut soup, don't you think? But the growing demand for fish is making some fishermen engage in illegal fishing activities. To address this, the Central Regional Minister, Marigold Asan, is urging farmers in the region to venture into fish farming to increase the country's fish stock. According to the minister, this can reduce the issue of illegal fishing in the country. R&B fans, 
was established to produce mainly tilapia and catfish to meet the demands for fish in both Ghana and on the international market and is located at Insuyaim and the Gomwa Central District of the Central Region. The economic significance of the business is to contribute towards narrowing the fish demand and supply gap in Ghana and in West Africa. According to the Central Regional Minister Marigold Hassan, who paid a working visit to the farm together with the Deputy Interior Minister Nana Eyia, the establishment of such farms comes in handy as they help in dealing with illegal fishing at sea. She also indicated that the farm will in the end create 1 million jobs in 10 years if it's managed properly. Despite facing challenges such as drawbacks from the land tenure system, among others, the farms has been able to rise above reproach to thrive. This is a unique way of fish farming and it is helping us to uh, go against the illegal way of fishing in the seas of which government is spending so much money into, into that. So it's a unique way and we are praying that uh, other farmers will also learn this way of uh, farming so that together we'll be able to save our uh, water bodies from illeg any illegal form of uh, uh, fishing. I'm happy because it's happening live in Central Region. We all know that Central Region wants to give opportunities for our young men and women to get employment. I understand that when this is fully uh, done, we're going to have one million people getting jobs in the next 10 years. So it's a good news, a great one. As a regional minister, I embrace this with all seriousness. Interested because uh, looking at the program that they are running here, they are even going to prepare their own feeding for the animal, the fingerlings, they are going to raise them from here. They are not going to bring them outside uh, the facility where there are a lot of uh, diseased animals and all of that. So it's a very good uh, practice. We are praying that most farmers will also learn from uh, this exercise and then scale it up with the whole region. A lot of people are going to get employment, more especially women. The Fisheries Commission has meanwhile indicated its resolve to provide the farm with technical support to ensure its survival. Michael Atadazi is the executive director of the Fisheries Commission. We brought staff here to come and do the soil profiling and testing and also the water quality. I realized that the area is very good for aquaculture enterprise. So we uh, gave him the necessary expertise, necessary know-how. We brought staff to come and assist him with the construction. And uh, I must say that the fruits of that labor is what we are witnessing today. And we have always doffed our hearts for R&B farms. What we can do is to give the know-how, give the technical support to ensure that at least technical support scheme, which constitutes about 30% of the cost of production, we are giving that to you free. I think that is also uh, a support that we need to recognize and appreciate. We turn now to the Western region where President Akufuado has launched the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program with the aim of reducing the hardship brought about by Operation Halt activities. This program is to create a source of livelihood for persons affected by the halt in illegal mining activities. The National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program is an intervention spearheaded by the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. It has six models including the National Land Reclamation and Reafforestation Program, Agriculture and Agro-Processing, Apprenticeship, Skills Training and Entrepreneurship, Responsible, Viable and Sustainable Small-Scale Community Mining, Mine Support Services, and Community Enhancement Project. Launching the program at the University of Mines and Technology in Takwa, President Nanado said the program was born out of the difficulties recorded as a result of measures taken to address the illegal mining menace. He says government is committed to funding the program. The following I had to draw the deal with illegal mining activities in Brazil, many more illegal miners have lost their illegal sources of livelihood. It is to provide legitimate alternative sources of livelihood for such persons the government has decided to initiate the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program. 
This program, first of all, seeks to mitigate the unavoidable hardships which our efforts to sabotage the small scale mining sector has created. Particularly, the five regions of operation of carrying out its operation. It is intended to provide good economic livelihood option to illegal mining and its associated activity. The Ministry of Finance is committed to making adequate budgetary allocation in the upcoming 2022 budget for government to fund this very important policy. The Lands and Natural Resources Minister said his ministry came out with a program after a nationwide consultation to find a solution to the illegal small scale mining. We have undertaken several consultations with relevant stakeholders to solicit their support for the measures we are taking. I have therefore led the ministry to engage with the Council of State, the National House of Chiefs, all regional ministers, civil society organizations in the mining sector, miners in the field and many others. The outcomes of these engagements have been very positive and I thank all involved for their cooperation. We expect to launch a total of 18 schemes with 100 concessions by the end of the year. Our commitment, Mr. President, is to deliver 100 well-regulated, responsible, environmentally sound community mining schemes across the country before the end of 2020. The acting coordinator of the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program, while highlighting the criteria for qualification, said the program is targeting 1 million beneficiaries. We are hoping that we would provide, you know, uh, a million jobs uh, to the communities, the five mining regions which have been earmarked. Uh, some of 60, about 60 land, uh, lands which have been degraded have also been identified that we are going to uh, so, um, in a nutshell, we're very, very grateful that the President is committed to providing alternative livelihood for illegal miners. And, uh, you know, hopefully in the next year, we will be able to absorb all of them into sustainable employment. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Mines and Technology, Professor Richard Akwesia Mankwa, announced that UMAT has started rolling out training programs to support the beneficiaries of the National Alternative Employment and livelihood program. A lot of people in the country are engaged in the informal sector, but just a few of such people have secured pensions. This means a lot of people will retire with almost nothing to fall on. The government is planning to get at least almost half of persons in the informal sector on a pension scheme. Employment and Labor Relations Minister Ignatius Bafuewa is worried the majority of Ghanaians, especially those in the informal sector, retire without a guaranteed pension. To this end, the government, he said, was working to raise the penetration of pensions in the informal sector from 3% to 40% in five years. The length and breadth of this country, um, educating the masses on, on, on the need for each and every person. You don't need to be a salaried worker before you can be on pensions. Thankfully, His Excellency the President has um, actually um, inaugurated the COCO pension, which is also an informal form of pension. Um, as I indicated in my sp speech, we have roughly 12 million people who are working, but uh, unfortunately we have um, less than 2 million who are in one form of pension, uh, tax. Um, is to be able to raise this informal, informal pension uh, from a, a low level of 3% penetration to 40% penetration in the next five years. He also wants employees to demand payment of their pensions contribution from their employers. I indicated that if, if you are an employee, it is your right to, to yes, you are, it is your right to demand um, information about uh, your contributions towards your pensions. It can either be um, the mandatory tier one, which is SNIT. I know that there are one or two um, organizations that do default over a period of time. Um, if that comes to our knowledge, then um, the necessary legal punishment will be meted out to them. But you can also help us as an employee 
um, because we may not have ears everywhere in the country. So if you give us a, a whistle uh, a blower distance, it will help us to be able to monitor and to also reach your employers and, and uh, tell them that yes, um, we are aware you are not paying um, Susan Sue's contribution at the right place. So come and answer why you are not doing that. So help us to fight for you. The ongoing Nationwide Pensions Awareness Week is to help bridge the knowledge gap among stakeholders and, in the long run, improve participation in pensions and retirement planning. Chief Executive Officer of the National Pensions Regulatory Authority outlines some strategies his office has adopted to increase pensions in the informal sector. It's conception that pension is only for the formal sector. That perception is very deep. And we need to continue with our education and sensitization for people to understand. And also, you have to bring the, new, uh, the, the message to the people where they work. It is difficult to get people to leave their, their shops, their marketplaces, you know, magazine, leave and come over here. It's difficult. So what we started doing is to organize pension clinics near where they work, market activation and the marketplaces. The nationwide exercise is on the theme Total Participation in Pension. The president of the National House of Chiefs has been commenting on his expectation of metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies on the use of revenues accrued from stool lands. Some of the MMDAs have been using the money for the collection of refuse and he isn't too pleased with it. Per Section 7 of the Stool Land Administration Act 481, 1994, 10% of the revenue accruing from stool lands shall be paid to the office to cover administrative expenses and the remaining revenue shall be disbursed in the following proportions by the administrator A. 25% to the stool through the traditional authority for the maintenance of the stool in keeping with its status B. 20% to the traditional authority and C. 55% to the Districts, president of the National House of Chiefs wants assemblies to use such revenue judiciously. Observation is the completion of developmental projects by MMDs. We congratulate them, but let me also take this opportunity to warn those who use the money to collect garbage, who should cease from using the money to collect garbage, because garbage once it is taken. It is very difficult to go back to account for the quantity that was taken. And that is where the leakage is. But I thank you for using some of the money to build classrooms, clinics, and so on and so forth. The administrator of Stool Lands, Mami Ama Edmaze Akwa, disclosed that her office has been able to collect almost 100 million Ghana cities in revenue in 2020 as compared to over 8.4 million Ghana cities collected in 2006. She, however, cited chieftaincy and land boundary disputes as challenges hindering smooth revenue collection. So where the conflicts, especially chieftaincy disputes, it does affect, first of for the mobilization and even the disbursement because if there's a piece of land and people are uh, disputing the owner who are you going to give the money to and because the owner is not certain they do not give you the chance to go onto the land to mobilize the revenue mm. so that is how it affects us as an office nananong are doing a lot in fact without nananong i don't know what we could have done sometimes they do they beat the gongo and tell them to pay and one time when we hold their best nananong are with us also explaining to them the reason and the need for them to pay the ground rent, especially to the tenant farmers there, that is the Abunu and the Abusan holders. That's where the Nananum family, they talk to them a lot. Mm. Minister for Lands and Natural Resources Samuel Abujinapo is worried over how some stool lands were being converted into family lands and maintained that the determination of a stool land remains a matter of law. Use of multiple sale of land the grant of large tracts of land without recourse to the community, and the overall development plan of the area, misappropriation and misapplication of stool lands revenue, stool land boundary uh, disputations, are but just a few of some of the challenges that must be addressed. I am also informed 
that there are some communities where in order to avoid the requirements of the law, school lands are purportedly being converted into family lands. The status of a land as being school land or family land is a matter of law and custom. The constitution which establishes the office of the administrator of school lands to collect and manage school revenue defines school lands to include, and I quote, any land or interest, any land or interest in or right over any land controlled by a stool or skin, the head of a particular community or the captain of a company for the benefit of the subjects of that stool or members of that community or company. The event was dubbed OASL at 25 assessing the past, redefining the future of customary land administration. With the way robbery attacks are becoming rampant these days, everybody has to be very security conscious when carrying cash around. To be safe, the chief executive of the Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement System gives a subsidiary of the Bank of Ghana, Mr. Achihesi, is urging businesses and individuals to liaise with their financial institutions or mobile money operators to raise their threshold to allow them to make huge transfers and no longer have to carry cash. There has been an uptake in the number of armed robbery attacks on bullion vans as well as on persons and institutions with huge sums of cash in recent times with the latest being an attack which led to the death of a security guard at Ahenema Kokobeng in the Ashanti region last week. As a result of past and recent incidents, various stakeholders including the Ghana Police Service, the Ghana Association of Bankers and the Bank of Ghana have been working together to ensure the movement of cash by banks and individuals is done safely. But according to the Ghana Interbank Pay Payment and settlement system gives, individuals and businesses can also play their part to reduce the risk of being attacked. In an interview with City Business News, the chief executive of Gibbs, Mr. Archihesi, said financial institutions in the country are open to raising the transfer thresholds of their customers if the necessary requirements are satisfied. The issue of threshold is linked to the KYC that you submit before an account or a bank wallet is opened for you. Um, if you have the necessary KYC for a bank account to be opened for you, all banks would, for uh, safety reasons, would uh, set a threshold. Some of them are individual, others are bank-wide. And it's your money. So if you believe and you feel that the threshold is not appropriate for your operations, you talk to your relationship manager or person, and it's either increased accordingly. I've never heard of a case where there is a problem where it's your money, you want to do big ticket transactions, and you are refused. It doesn't happen. Secondly, if you are a wallet account holder, now mainly these are individuals who were not able to satisfy the KYC needed for bank accounts. There are three categories in, in Ghana now. So based on the KYC that you produce will determine whether you are giving the lowest or the middle or the very uh, high uh, KYC. So if you are an individual and you submit, you produce a KYC which is uh, qualifies you for the lowest one, but your transactions requires a higher one, all you have to do is to ask, what is the necessary KYC that I need? for me to qualify me to go in for the medium or the higher band. And that's basically what it is. And then you focus on that. You satisfy the KYC, your transaction limit is then increased and then off you go. Well, this is all time will allow us for this week's edition of the Business Weekly Show, your most watched business show in the country. My name is Michael Obodu. Please hit me up on Twitter at M Obodu. But don't miss out on the business dashboard. It airs at 10 p.m. sharp every weekday. You can also catch a repeat the following day at 7 and 10.30 a.m. Our website, citybusinessnews.com, has regular business news update for you. So, well, catch you same time next week. Stay safe, stay informed, and bye-bye.